Okay, thank you. If we can start the uh, introductions again. Um, Wayne, I believe you let off last time. Yeah, uh, so Wayne Granger, product owner from Legend. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, I'll continue on, I guess. I'm Tim Hill, uh, technical um, lead for Open Active at the Open Data Institute. Over Steve. to you, Stephen. Yeah, Stephen Winfield Giello. Uh, Alice? Alice John for Global. Izzy. Izzy Champion, Data and Innovation Lead at uh, Sporting England. Uh, Nish. Nish to sign from my men. And finally, Nick. Uh, Nick from the ODI and I'm in. Okay, great. Fantastic. Okay, um, so this could be a fairly uh, intricate call. Um, this is following on from a call back in November regarding customer authentication, which is central to uh, the use cases of um, MCR Active, Active Westminster, and I think more generally across the sector. Uh, Nick did us a great favor in writing up very lucidly the issues that we ended up taking a look at in the last call. I think we were fairly far from a resolution in the last call. Uh, so I'm just hoping to go over really um, my summary of Nick's summary in the course of this call, make sure that we've uh, flushed all of the issues out and have some confidence in that. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here so that you can take a look at the very digested um, version of, this, of the summary that I've made. Uh, one moment here. So are all of you seeing the open active title slide right now? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. Um, it might be helpful for those of you who, have, who are in a browser right now to go to the URL here on GitHub, um, which is the thread that contains initial discussion of the issues, then the summary, and a little bit of further discussion from there. Um, in very broad summary, uh, there's three use cases basically involving customer authentication, uh, depending on where the authentication uh, occurs to. Um, one is, the first use case is the situation in which the user account is purely with the broker, um, meaning the agent that is making the booking rather than the agent that the booking is with. Uh, for example, if you have, say, an MCR active card or an active Westminster card or something like that, um, that agency acts as the broker in that in that case, uh, and the, the account is only with them. In the second use case, the user account is held with the provider of the services. Um, so somebody like GLL, for instance. Uh, and in that case, the broker is acting as a sort of thin client on top of just relaying information to the seller, really. And then in the third use case, uh, there are accounts with both the broker and the seller. Uh, so those are the three use cases under review. Um, I'll just take you through a somewhat more extended account of each of those. Um, please jump in with any objections, queries, or considerations you think haven't been accounted for in this summary, and we can just start unpicking them now. Uh, once I've gone through these, th these three use cases, I'll highlight three or four issues that are actually on the GitHub thread that are up for discussion. But I think it's important at this stage to continue to elicit further concerns as they arise. So um, use case one, um, as I said, this is when the user account is with the broker. Um, in many cases, although not necessarily, the broker will have some kind of deal in place with the provider whereby a discount is offered to people who have got this kind of broker account. Uh, so the examples below um, cover that fairly comprehensively. So in the case of uh, Decathlon, uh, it'd be possible if you've logged into Decathlon to use that ID for booking. Uh, MCR Active can offer a 30% discount, I think in some cases, uh, to participating institutions. Uh, and Active Westminster has got a range of discounts. Um, so in all of these cases, uh, 
having a particular relationship with the broker entitles you to discount on the seller end. Um, I think this covers probably the bulk of use cases that we actually have in the wild right now, but is there any additional comment to be made on this scenario? Um, I guess this is all within the context of um, what's kind of opportunities that are made available via the um, opportunity suite, isn't it? Oh, sorry, can you say that again? On this? So, so the context of all this conversation is, is, is within the current scope of the uh, opportunity suite and booking feed. So it's nothing to, so if, for example, GLL didn't expose some classes or to, to the feed, they would be out of scope of this. I think we mentioned that in the last session, didn't we? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we can only yeah. operate on what on what's available out there as open data. That's yeah. right. Um, okay. yeah, so it would be it would be possible, I suppose, to have a separate API um, that allowed other information to be communicated uh, over over another channel entirely, but within the channels established within the current booking specification. Yeah, it's just about what's out there in the open. Tim, in, in this example, uh, uh, and the second one, you've got MSR Active 30% discount. Um, MSR Active isn't acting as a broker, are they? Because I'm in, in this instance, would be the broker. So if we had if we had different arrangements with different consumers, but via the same broker, how would that work? Um, An example of this would be that, but, and Nish can jump in here, MSR Active in Manchester, he uses I'm as a broker, and so does Croydon. Right. Might have different it's, it's, it, it might be worth um, there's there's uh, there's some some new language that um, uh, we proposed as part of the documentation that might help with this because I think we've we've got unstuck around what a book what a broker is versus what other things are. So okay. Um, I guess it's a good time to try and introduce that new language here to see if it sticks. Um, in the booking spec, it's called. Um, um, uh, the authenticated party, but the language we're, we're um, thinking of using um, is a booking partner. And so basically the booking partner is the organization that you've given the keys uh, and access to your booking system to. Um, and that might be Public Health England, it might be I'm in, um, it might be uh, Go Sweat, it might be Move GB. And then the broker is the is the front end, is the public facing entity. So the broker would be changed for life, it would be Decathlon, it would be Move GB's own front end. Um, so separating the idea that the broker, which is the thing that the user feeds and interacts with, from the booking partner, which is the entity that gets the credentials. Um, because sometimes they're the same and sometimes they're different. Um, so that might help explain. Mm -hmm. I mean, would then be a booking partner um, and uh, the brokers would be yeah. multiple brokers, as you've listed there, through I'm in. Uh, but but as others could do the same. Yeah, that okay. yeah. yeah, that explains a lot. Yes, yeah, that changes my understanding of the terminology we were being referring to previously. But yeah, that helps. Great. So Tim, I had a I had a question on this, but we, it might get parked till later because um, I know we want to get into use cases two and three. Um, it's it's related to um, how we get the prices for for the right prices for those discounts, um, whether it's coming through the opportunity feed or elsewhere, um, in order to be able to charge the MCR active user the right price based on what concession they're allowed. Yeah, I think that's the, really the nub difficulty. Um, I mean, pricing is the most obvious example of a general question of what information you expose publicly and the fact that given that this is an open data specification, essentially everything is out there. Um, so the current mechanism for this would indeed be that the seller feed had all of the pricing information in it, and then it's on the broker to select from those prices appropriately. Which is an approach that would work for, for us, but then I don't, currently there's only, I think, um, what would it be called? Headline price, sort of normal adult junior pay as you go pricing coming through the opportunity feeds um, this could be a feed specific question which is why I didn't I don't know if it was a topic for now or for later 
um, that that's maybe something we can re we can revisit as, as we've gone through the questions and we figure out what's the most important ones to talk about. Yeah. So if it's helpful, the way that this would this would be implemented, for example, with um, with Gladstone, would be that it would be a new offer in that list of offers um, so that would be thirty percent less. So you've got adult discounted adult basically uh, discounted junior. And so it would be additional uh, offers that would then be present in the open data and then they would be used to make the booking. I think the challenge that you've got is that whilst there may be, say, six different prices, oh, say six different prices for a particular activity, even that's probably a bit more, might not be as many as that. You could push all those into the feed and go, OK, for this particular activity, you might pay. Ten pounds if you're this particular type of person. Nine pounds if you're this one. Eight pounds, seven pounds, six pounds, five pounds, four pounds. There are your different prices. That's okay. Now, where they're fairly straightforward, like that's adult, that's junior, that's concession, then the logic for the broker to know which one to apply for the given person who's making that booking is fairly straightforward. The challenge comes where you've got members who might have multiple subscriptions, and the logic certainly within our system that's going through to kind of go right given all these kind of memberships and subscriptions that member is paying for what is the correct price for that specific member for that activity given the time they're booking it the times of day when their different memberships might be valid or not is very complex and that's not something that you could just push to the broker to kind of go you go and work out whether that specific person should be charged five pound four pound two pound fifty six pound eighty seven whatever it might be because there's a lot of complicated logic into working that out yeah I think absolutely. that's the challenge with putting all throwing just going we'll stick all the various pricing options into the feeds yeah absolutely guy it might be helpful to the, the, the three options we're talking through um that very much speaks to the second two options um, mm. because this current option would definitely not facilitate that level of complexity you, you'd end up with like 50 different prices in the feed with all sorts of madness uh so so yes so that i suppose is what the second the, the second two which i guess tim would, would go to next uh would would cover this is just this is just for guests uh to allow them to get discounts so it's guest mm. booking only the, the the presented option here is only for guests it's not for members if that's helpful yep Okay, so Nick, just to clarify that, that you're saying there that option one, uh, sorry, this this user journey, um, number one, is is only where there's a very limited, simple number of offers to do with discounts. Is that what you're saying? Ex ex exactly. It's for guests, uh, card holders, concessions, things like that, where there's a very straightforward, rationalised uh, discount basis that's going on, and they're the kind of prices that you would be able to publish openly across all the brokers without confusion because there's only a few of them like 30% off or 30 and 40% off but it, it wouldn't work if as guy says you've got 30% off but then an extra 5% if you happen to have a dog with you or whatever <laughs> yeah I think it's not it's not so much the number of prices you probably find even though it's if the number of different prices that you've got for given activity isn't that many it's the logic for determining which price to select it's where that is who has that logic so in the situation of decathlon if decathlon are the broker then they've got the logic on their side to know right you've got a decathlon account therefore we know which one to go for if it's mcr active you've got you're on the mcr active base so we know we pick the mcr active one it's where the kind of the logic and the decision making isn't on the broker's side it's in the kind of the management system side so again, you might still only have five prices, but you've got to know which one to pick. And it's that logic there of knowing which one to pick that makes the scenarios sure. complicated, not just the number sure. of different prices. Because you could have three prices, but if the logic to know which price is right to pick, you've still got a problem to make sure that that member gets the price that's right for them. And yeah, that's something that the broker's not going to be able to work out. Yeah, and I think that's why the, 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 the use cases here were more around um, the... Yeah, the pure cards. guest thing. Yeah, where you know it. The, yeah. the logic has said logic is on the MCR active side to know if you get a thirty percent discount. The logic is on the decathlon side. They know if you've got an account ID, so that's fine for those scenarios. So yeah, if it's just on that side, because you know which which of those prices to pick, and we can just push the price into the feeds as these are the options that are available. 
Although, I mean, that, that said, and maybe Alice and Nish will have a better sense of the realities here, even focus just on the guest side. Um, does the listing here where there's a basically one or two flat rate discounts adequately capture the complexity from that kind of borough or civic government level? Because I can, I can imagine, say, a hierarchy of discounts for maybe, maybe not for if you have a dog with you, but if you're an old age uh, pensioner, um, if you, um, you know, suffer from various uh, physical or psychological ailments, etc. I can imagine a fine grained place for all the um, LGA end of things as well, but I don't know if that is a reality. So I think, I think Westminster have done some, some rationalization to, to make it a, sh a short list. Um, um, Alice, if, if you're in the call, do you have an idea of the MCR? Yeah, um, so I think MCR have around six um, concessionary categories, um, ranging from, you know, if you live, if you're a resident in Manchester, then you get I think X percent discount or um, if you're an X service uh, personnel then you'll get another discount so I think it's around six categories that um, that they have um, and that would require some sort of documentary validation like offline in order to determine if that member um, uh, is entitled to that discount and, and then that would be that would be something that would be I guess stored against that that member record. Okay so of those six Sounds like there's a there's at least one or two that will be the simple one. Ish. As yeah. in, if you just have the MCI active user account and you get the thirty yeah. percent or whatever it is, Perfect. and those can go in the opportunity feed, and the others are probably use cases two and three where you okay. need to have some form of validation with the with the seller. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I was going to ask that question is where does that validation happen when you say you've got a, a certificate or an X service thing? Is that MCR active account that gets that discount across all providers in, in MCR active or is it only specifically with um, the operators? It's per operator. I think it, it is. It's, it's per operator. Oh, yeah. OK, sorry. then. Yeah, it's, it's like a great great. 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 Yeah. Agreeing with what you're saying, then. So it sounds like what you're saying, two and three, and the same as what Guy was saying. But that's all stuff that gets gets sorted in the in the I've got a membership I need to log in category. Right. Okay. So that sounds like. I mean, it sounds like we're rapidly approaching actually uh, scenarios two or three. They're hard to to skirt around then. Um, and in fact, if it's on, if it's on a pure institution basis, I'm wondering of the extent to which scenario one even exists at all. Um, so scenario two. Well, it sounds like one is is the case for the discounts, right? For the guests, that's the same. That's definitely a thing that's needed, yeah. I think for, if for, I've understood for, Man point. for Manchester yeah, guests and for Active Westminster guests, it sounds like this is the use case they'll use predominantly. And then for the more edge case concessions, we'll move on to the other use cases where there's a deeper level of pricing change or validation required. I think these two, this use case will cover, I think, the majority of the MCR Active and Active Westminster sort of everyday bookers. Oh, okay, so the 30% the discount is blanket. Yeah, so I think, sounds like, I think we've, at least been talking to Guy there, it sounds like we can get the 30%, um, let's call it blanket discounts into the feed because there's not that many of them. Yeah. Um, and the broker has the ability to know, to charge their users that, that price rather than the normal page you go price because that person has an MCR active account and therefore it validates them to, to access that price but for all the other types of uh, as Nick said bringing your dog or as Alice said being uh, ex-army service or something requires the other use cases we were going to come on to I think okay right okay so so scenario one okay um, covers the majority great as the simplest um, User account with seller only. Um, so here, all of the information is on the seller's system. The seller has got all of the logic. Um, the examples here are change for life, which I think is a very thin client, if my understanding is correct. Uh, and then we've also got everyone active systems, which are managing uh, active Westminster entitlements. Uh, so then the logic might become quite complex, but it's all centralized on the side of the seller. So 
So this is this is the situation that we started to talk about in connection with scenario one, where the logic gets gets branching fast um, on the supplier side. Um, is there anything further to add in connection to this, or have we basically covered this off already? Okay, sounds like sounds like we're done with that. Um, and then we've got the user account with both. Um, so here, the the accounts are linked, uh, but the link is not symmetrical in the sense that the broker has to be aware of customer memberships with providers, um, but providers are not aware of of particular brokers' relationship with memberships. So, so if somebody has got an MCR active account and they are also connected to GLL facilities within um, the MCR umbrella. Um, the the MCR um, application um, is is aware of those memberships, uh, but GLL is not aware of the broker membership. Um, and the other example given is if you had some sort of quite um, uh, customized kind of app that was for for individual training or something like that, uh, and it would have to have the knowledge to suggest activities to you that fell within your existing um, seller memberships. Um, again, yeah, again, I feel like we've already bled into this area. So we might as well simply move on to the questions arising from this, which are dealt with in the thread. Um, so the first question, well, really all of the questions are about the visibility of offers in the open data feed, seeing all of them. Um, and the logic that selects amongst them. Um, because as has already been pointed out, uh, the logic is complicated and um, sticking all of that into one feed is not necessarily practical given the number of permutations, I would assume. Um, and there's also a kind of user journey problem in that in the booking flow is currently defined, the first thing that you do is confirm the availability of the thing that you're trying to book. And that should give you some kind of headline price. But of course, at that initial point, um, the user is not authenticated yet. And so that price is going to be inaccurate if displayed as a headline price. I don't know how much of an obstacle people feel that is to their use cases and or whether this is something people feel that we can kind of design around without worrying too much. I think for for me it's the the experience for that that end user because as, as I mentioned at the start of the, the the conversation, this feed is only and I think we're talking about here are only the items people like GLL have chosen to expose through the feed, and as a member there might be other things that are not exposed to this feed, so you're going to get unless the 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 third parties building these apps use both the ODI work and a direct connection outside of the ODI to the providers, that end user is going to get a partial experience. They're going to see the ODI stuff, but they haven't got the link with the actual, not with the member specific or non-ODI stuff. They're already going to see half the story or even less. And I think for me, that's the bit that I'm, that concerns me the most, mm -hmm. uh, how, how that aspect works. I mean, obviously, by one of the providers, the software providers, so it's not technically something that I should be jumping up and down about, but from the I'm in point of view, that you've already handled in half a relationship. And that's a bit, that's what concerns me here. So I guess the question is, um, is uh, maybe I'm not aware of um, the differences uh, between the direct and as you as you call it, the ODI feed. Why, why is there things not in the ODI feed that are potentially useful to, for the consumer? Is there um, some commercial requirements or something? Why they're not included in the feed? I, I guess there might be things that um, as that a member specific that GLL or somebody else might not want to put into the ODI feed because they only want them for their members. A question from me in relation to the, the Manchester project, the MCR Active project, and 
Stephen, you might be able to, to comment on this. My understanding is that um, all of the um, opportunities that are available to Manchester residents, both you know, run by operators and, and community-based providers would be included in the, in the opportunity speed. And that um, I think is something that's an expectation from um, MCR Active. So I'm not aware of any sort of cases where there would be activities slash opportunities that that wouldn't be included in that field in that feed. Um, so it would be good to 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 get some specific examples. And I guess if if there is a plan to to not include you know certain opportunities within that feed, then it's probably a conversation we'd need to have with with MCR Active for for that specific project. It's probably worth mentioning that I just used GNL as an example. Um, <laughs> there may be other providers that on this call that are of a similar mindset where they might not want to expose everything to the feed. Well, we've, we've um, in the test case scenarios we've done so far, we've exposed everything we think is relevant for the partnerships that uh, we're working with. And if, if i just thinking back to the, um, the recent tests we did, Nish, um, when you expose the data for the test sites, but on the MSR Active website. If I remember rightly, everything we saw there was what we expected to be able to see um, and what we think the client will be able to see based on what we're providing. And the headline price that was exposed was also accurate. Um, there were no further discounts presented. It was just literally the headline price for the activity. So um, from my perspective, everything was working as I expected to, but I'm not sure whether the client would be happy with that. I suspect they would be. Um, but that didn't expose any of the discounts that would be available to anybody who has a particular membership. Now, if you've got a membership and you're going via the MSR Active website or any other, um, any other broker website, then um, the, the, um, the booking partner would have to uncouple the membership architecture with us in order to expose the right price to the right membership type. That's a huge piece of work. It really is because our membership architecture is exceptionally confusing. Um, and you know it's it's, it's taken it's taken our um, it's taken our web provider who's been working with us our website hosting partner who's been working with us now for about six years six years to understand the membership architecture we're just about to put our pricing on the website directly from Legend so um, you know it's no mean feat that piece of work if it's just headline price it's straightforward it's easy because you've done that already and it's and it's accurate mm -hmm. but it's it's fraught with difficulty because the membership architecture is massively complicated. Okay, so, so if I'm understanding you rightly, then the question of there being entire opportunities that are, that are open to members only isn't a concern as far as, as GLL is concerned in terms of concrete use cases right now. No, not, not in terms of opportunity, but in terms of price, there might be. Right, okay. So, I mean, it's possible to imagine handling the user journey with a lot of flags and warnings saying, uh, you know, this headline price is only indicative, discounts have not yet been applied, and so on and so forth. Um, and it's hard to see actually how any other approach could be taken within the terms of the specification, given that authentication happens late in the process. Um, but Nick, is, is there something I'm missing about the way the spec works? No, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Ultimately, this is um, open data uh, which we're booking and uh, adding an ability to, to authenticate to get the pricing that you uh, deserve as a member um, is, is something which is definitely a thing that would be possible after you've selected the thing you want because that, at that point you've already zoned in on the system you're connecting to and the provider and the seller you're connecting to and the membership you've got and all the rest of it. But at the selection, the point of selection, when you've got hundreds of providers potentially that you're sifting through looking for opportunities, uh, that is it. I think that that's the challenge, isn't it? If you're, if you're presenting to MCR 100 different sellers and all of them uh, are just giving you the headline prices, um, the, the idea that within that you know, list you could be scrolling through of 100, that, that a few of those might have an applicable discount to you and that you could somehow pick out that discount and apply that pricing so that those those numbers at that search page are relevant. I think that's um, 
probably quite quite a technically complex thing to do as i guess everyone's alluding to so it it, yeah. it might just be in a oh it, it might just be that um the compromise i suppose this question is is asking us for is is it sufficient to have the headline price on the search page and when you click through to the next page is when you therefore that at that point get the the correct pricing because you've got authentication in place and you can leverage the seller uh seller's pricing architecture i think i think i think no one i think no one's saying that it's it makes any sense to try and replicate that on the broker because that that is i mean one the standards don't support it and two as Stephen alluded to it's 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 a crazy uh, task to even start at this point I'm, I'm trying to think of what it would be like from a consumer perspective so I'm just trying to think of like how other websites buying booking anything kind of works I feel like sometimes you might have almost like a sticker saying there's going to be this 30% off but you wouldn't necessarily expect to see that until right at the end of the process your discount has been applied sort of thing I guess maybe there's an interesting quandary around if I'm an MCR active member and I know that I'm going to get my 30% off do I expect that to be applied from <clears throat> sorry from right at the beginning or I guess the other version is from a consumer perspective oh that £10 class looks a bit expensive but actually if I knew it was 30% cheaper maybe I would have been interested um, but maybe this is I guess we're dealing a little bit in the hypothetical at the moment before we've launched and tested any of these different ways of presenting it. And I don't know whether that actually affects the standards. It's more about how that data is presented to a consumer by the broker. I think I'm using the right language now, by the broker. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know if that's useful. I mean, equally, is this a thinking about from an induced perspective? If you're one of these people who has, for example, got a membership with everyone active, how likely are you as you know obviously everyone active invest heavily in providing booking systems for their members kind of building that relationship with their members if i was a member of everyone active am i going to go through the kind of mcr active portal to make my booking or because i've built a relationship with a everyone active i know i get my discounts with everyone active am i going to go through their booking system where i start that journey off by logging in and therefore I get all my preferential pricing. And are we potentially worrying about members who are going to go to the MCR Active sort of portal, browse through stuff, and then quite late on in that journey kind of go, oh, actually I'm an Everyone Active member. I don't, I don't know how likely that journey is. Um, and equally even for if you are kind of just browsing through there, is it more a how that whole website as a whole is is designed that you're promoting the fact that as a resident of Westminster you're potentially going to get a discount through there so that you're yeah these are headline prices that you just put up there um, there's some kind of banner or whatever advertising is say they're potentially 30% off and at the point where you get to identifying yourself as being a resident of of Westminster and therefore applicable to some discount and that's all checked out on the broker side because they know they've got the checks there to then go all right we can now pick you up the, the appropriate price for that you know does it matter then that you are just presenting headline prices because you're kind of without being very specific about exactly what price that member gets you've got these more generic kind of banners and things promoting the discounts that will potentially be on offer once you get to that stage in the user journey well I kind of take Guy's point of view on this is that we, we will certainly as, as a one of the sellers will be encouraging our members to make their booking journey via the GLL provided booking opportunities whether it's through the app or whether it's through the web pages or whatever else we provide but our course won't be the only route for members to make bookings because MCR Active will be encouraging people who need who are concessions to book to sell the membership and to then book via MCR Active so it, there will be user cases um, but, so it's going, to, it's going to be a combination, isn't it? It's going to be a combination of both. Um, I was looking at the, the membership tier discounting for MCR Active, and we've got four levels of discounting. So Alice is right, there are about six or seven categories, but only across uh, three price ranges. Headline price, which is for nobody who's got any discount whatsoever. And then you've got 40, 30, and 15, depending on what type of concession you might be, whether you're resident or non-resident. So it's not overly complicated, 
Um, but nevertheless, it's still three pricing tiers, which I've discounted from the headline price. And it seems to me that they want to be able to present those price discounts on their website, looking at the uh, a couple of documents I'm just reading there. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think we're saying that, oh, I was going to say sorry, Alex, before, I just, I think, I think that's possible. I think, I think we're saying that, that version option one, which is definitely, definitely technically feasible, and, and I think we kind of moved on from, um, does, the, does cover that, does allow you to have three or four options. Um, so, so if that's what MCR's desire is, then at, we can kind of tick the box and say that's, that, that works. I think what, what maybe doesn't work is when you've got a monthly membership and some of the stuff you've got is half price because it's included in your monthly, some of it's free. Um, that's where we get into the ground where I think we can't, we can't get to the point. I don't, it's probably technically infeasible at this stage. I think it's fair to say to present this is a free thing because you're an everyone active member on the search screen. I think that's kind of the, the bottom line. Um, sorry, Alice. No, no, no. It's just to, I guess, reiterate yours and, and Stephen's point, really. The expectation from MCR is that on the search screen that there would be um, some sort of headline discount categories displayed. Um, you know, it seems that if there are three potential discounts and they, those should be displayed on the, on the search screen. I think the secondary stage that they're then expecting is, you know, based on that member authenticating their account, they would then be able to, to book on to the relevant session um, at, the, at the correct rate, depending on what you know, concession they had assigned to their, to their member account. But, but the first, I think we've covered off the first aspect, but just to, to confirm really that the, that is Manchester's expectation is that they'll, they'll be able to see some concessionary price um, when they're searching for activities on the MCR Active um, website. But uh, Alice, is, is, is that um, an indication of the price discount they're going to get? Or is that um, the expectation that's an actual discounted price pulled from Legend, which has been uncoupled from the various membership types that we've set up in Legend? So my understanding, it, an indication is my understanding. Um, uh, so maybe it's worth the, um, differentiating between those three or four, Stephen, as you mentioned, um, was it 40, 13, 15 percent? Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Pricing, yeah. which yeah. Um, we discussed at the top of the call, um, could potentially go in the opportunity feed. And I don't know if that's the, what you're talking about there as being hard, as hard to extract from legend, but that's one category. And then the second category is, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've signed up to an MC Active account, um, but I've also got a GLL membership, which is a racket membership at this specific center in, in Manchester. So when I want to book something at that center for, for, this type of activity, I get a very um, specific price back based on who I am and what membership I have. So that's that second bit of pricing, that, that special pricing there. Um, I don't think we expect, and we're not talking about that being in the feed, and we're not trying to show that in the search, um, but we do need to get that at some point in the flow so we can charge the user the right amount yeah. for that for that booking for their for their type of relationship to GLR. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I'm not sure I entirely agree with the user case, though, because, uh, again, just going back to making this as simple as you possibly can, I still think that mem members who have a, have a, a payment relationship with GLL will, will continue to book via GLL booking opportunity websites and apps. And it's only the pe people who come via MCR Active who don't have a, um, a payment plan, for want of a better description, with GLL, might be booking through um, MCR Active or opportunity bookers. That's how I see it. But I could be wrong. Yes, I think, um, and maybe Alice can confirm it. But I think I think you're right in terms of the, the majority of the use cases. Hopefully, is is that you know, Jill have a relationship with thousands of, of monthly um, paying members, and hopefully that continues. Um, but I think MCR have a vision where some of those GLL monthly paying members also have a relationship with MCR Active because they might um, do different types of activities with different types of providers throughout the year. And they'll end up using MCR Active as their primary point to make all of their bookings yeah. and see all of their activities. And so to do that, that MCR Active member will need to be able to um, find and book all types of activities available to them, both through their membership with GLR as well as pay go with other sellers um, mm -hmm. through the MCR Active portal. So I agree with you. I think the majority of these cases will hopefully continue using the GLL app and all that kind of stuff. But I think as part of MCR and active and, and GLR's relationship, they'll need to be these user journeys accounted for 
and I think these are the kind of use cases that account for them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I just need to pick up on a comment that Nick made when he, and I think he suggested there was a tick in the box because these prices are available. Forgive me if I've misunderstood that, Nick. Um, but but and, and, until, I, until I see how you unpick that price and discounting based on the, um, the type of membership relationship somebody has with MSR Active Stroke GLL, then I'm going to reserve judgment as to whether that's doable because um, we, we've got a lot of unpicking to just to make sure that you're getting the right price for the right activity for the right membership. I haven't seen that yet. I've only seen the headline price. Oh, I see. So, so specifically, you're, sorry, you're right. I meant from a standards perspective, there's a tick in the yeah. box. Uh, from a yeah. legend system perspective, um, yes, I, there's the question about how, how you would um, select where your 30% off thing comes from. Is driven for, from, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Right. So we get a kind of combinatorial explosion of, of possibilities. It's just difficult to deal with on the supplier side. Is that the, is that an accurate summary? Well, I think it's just more that, that, that within the systems, both Gladstone and Legend, you need to have, figure a way out of saying, that, you know, this is, because the, the, those systems are designed for heavily complex membership structures with, <laughs> with an infinite combination of possibilities. And what we're really talking about here is surfacing public facing two to five discounts that anyone can see that aren't tied to any of that complexity. They're just upfront. These are the numbers you get. Um, like, you know, the, the, the kind of cart you'd expect to see printed out if you walked in somewhere. Like if you just go, you, these are the prices you can choose from, but, but the kind of customized complex stuff is, 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 is what the system's designed to do. So I think what Stephen's um, referring to is there's a, is it necessary to have a bridge between those two things where you can tick some of those complex structures and have them surface up? And is that going to be really hairy? Or is there, is there a feature in, in the system where you can just kind of say, these are the three, these are the three discounts we have and they, they get surfaced as uh, um, directly rather than through, through the complexity. Um, because it's a guest room. These are only for guests um, specifically. These aren't for actual members. Um, and so that's why I guess because, because these are for guests, the membership structure actually doesn't apply anyway because <laughs> you've got guest accounts. But no, sorry, I'm I, then I'm I'm confused. So I thought I thought Nish was saying that under the MCR Active umbrella, um, we do have to cater for this kind of combination that people who are members are also going through MCR Active. Uh, so we, we, we need to really clearly separate this. There's two things that I think we maybe need to call them A and B because we've used a lot of numbers. <laughs> Option A is guest checkouts, which can get a number of discounts, maybe three, five, one discount. That's guest. They're, that's the tick in the box we talked about. That's the thing that the, the standard support as it, as it is right now. Um, scenario B is a membership booking. Someone who has a monthly membership wants to book a squash court with their rackets concession get some crazy logic pricing depending on when they subscribe to that membership, how long ago that was, how old they are, blah, 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 like loads of stuff that leads to a specific number. So, so B, we're saying there's no way we're going to put that on the homepage. The only way you get that in, at some point in the flow and you get that. Um, for A, we're saying that assuming there's a way of getting that out of the Legend and Gladstone systems such that you can get, you know, 30% for guests headline. Um, or secondary headline price or something, um, then that, that's feasible. So uh, A is feasible, uh, B is off the table for the search, but later in the booking process could be uh, available. Is that a good summary? Nick, it's a good summary, but I don't agree with it, unfortunately, because, um, <laughs> um, uh, because uh, well, not wanting to be pedantic, um, but there's absolutely no way that we're offering guest discount through our system, uh, unless you have a membership. There's only, there's only one discount available and that's you have to have a membership and then the discount varies depending on what type of membership you have. If you're a guest checkout, there's only one price you're paying and that's the headline price. Alice, forgive me if I'm wrong in that, but, or, or, or correct me, but that's the way GLL works and that's the way we've operated for years. And we're not changing that with Manchester or any other, with any other um, um, partner we're working with. That's a simple, that one. So, um... So Stephen, the, the, the guest, or, or what we're describing in Manchester as, as the pay and play um, member, if correct me if I'm wrong, uh, as, part, as an MCR active member, they will be offered um, a, a, an up to a 30% discount on activities across the city. Yeah. 
Um, for their members, not guests. Well, they're paying play. Yeah, still a member. A guest is somebody who has no relationship with us, therefore is an anonymous checkout, effectively. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just want to make sure, maybe I'm just understanding what, what the, the, our interpretation of guest is versus a member versus pay and play. But anybody who has a membership, which is pay and play, prepaid, annual, or whatever, is a member. Anybody who's a guest is not a member, therefore pays the headline price. Yeah, this, 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 so it sounds like there is a there is a um, uh, subtle difference in that. Um, yes. So my, when I said tick in the box and all of the things on the call so far, my assumption with that was that we were still talking about guests and that that would be where the um, the discount is associated. I, although this is, I suppose, it's, it's a system specific problem rather than a standards issue. Mm. Um, but nonetheless, um, yes, that's a that's a good. It's a good question because ultimately the the MCR people that book through MCR that are that have cards or, or whoever they are that they they are a guest as far as the booking system is concerned, um, but they they might have a as with as with Decathlon or anyone else they might have an existing member account with Decathlon, um, and so uh, that I guess is where the, the yeah the subtlety is. It sounds like a lot rides on unpicking this particular subtlety, though. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I can see. I can see what so, so Stephen's yeah, face. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I can't really without having somebody from MCR on the call. I'm not sure I can take that part of the conversation any any further forward. It, it's obviously a, a commercial discussion um, to have between between GLL and, and MCR. Well, we, we, we can put that after that list. We can, we can yeah. have a conversation with them sometime this week if you want to. I really don't yeah. mind, you know, just, just to make sure we understand we're on the same page. But, but for, yeah. the, for the purpose of clarity for this call, uh, we see at GLRC a distinction between guest and member. Yes. Just and, uh, mm, go on. Just to clarify on that, because obviously, well, not obviously, but within our terms of a, of a guest, you could have a junior rate for a guest and an adult rate for a guest and essentially a concessionary rate for a a guest, um, which doesn't necessarily having a record of a kind of a, an account within the plus two system, you still go through as, as a unknown kind of guest person, but you've got those three level of pricing, which would kind of come through in a similar way to the different levels of discount. It's not a federally is a discount because you're paying less than the, the headline rate. So if you're a junior and you're booking badminton, you'll play, pay less than an adult and booking badminton just again the prices you kind of play stick up on the board um even swimming junior swim adult swim fairly standard within the leisure environment to have that kind of pricing differentiation um which isn't dependent on having an account or a membership or anything like that it's just a your adult your junior and those kind of pricing rates how does that get accommodated within gll at the moment Well, the, the, um, the, the, the price for junior and adults are two separate price, price, uh, pricing points. So the junior price isn't a discount from the adult price. It's a set junior price. And then the, then the junior activity is discounted depending on membership type. So, uh, so for every activity, you've got two price points, non-member adult, non-member junior. Yep. And that's it. And is that the stuff that then come through to the, in the feeds as two different price points of your going? This is the feed for yeah, whatever that, activity. Yeah, that's that's what we're expecting to happen, and and that's what we've seen in in some of the demonstrations and testing we've done. Yeah, I haven't seen how the the discounting manifests itself within the um, the presentation. Okay, I'm afraid we've only got about three minutes left. Um, happy to go slightly over, um, but it sounds like some of the issues that have been raised, I think, probably merit a great deal of discussion. Um, probably not in this forum. Um, I think in terms of the standards, we still have standards that can accommodate a wide range of, of use cases, but we need some clarity about how exactly we see these use cases playing out. Um, I'm just trying to think what the best way forward is for this. Well, it sounds like the, the last comment that a guy made there, I mean, there might be ways that yeah, something for, uh, sorry, I mean, Stephen, maybe something to think about in terms of how the, 
that could maybe accommodate discounts but obviously there's some, there's much more of a business question there rather than the system question um and, and how that works um i might guess that assuming that well the first thing is can if that works for mcr and, and we can go ahead and guess um junior adult junior 30 percent adult 30 percent as the you know four options or whatever it is um then i guess the, the the spec probably doesn't need much to change to, to accommodate that and the bit we haven't really got to yet which i feel is where the spec would probably need to have these additional few bits in there um is the is the kind of b thing we talked about in uh I, I kind of mentioned that summary where um, it's about getting the the person that's actually got a membership, you know, one of the really complex cases to actually get the right price and make the booking at the end of the journey. Um, and so in terms of uh, this forum, I mean, assuming we don't need to come up with another way of solving the, um, obviously there's, there's some, there's some other stuff to happen around uh, the, the cases we just talked about for a, and to make sure that does work. But if that does work, there's no work there to do. The work that is need to, need, need to be done is that B case, um, and I guess there's a question around timescales for that because if we need to get B uh, spec into a good place, I know there's already some pre um, preliminary work going on with Gladstone around it um, for Westminster, um, but I'm aware that that's not really. I mean, the spec is all it's it's being based on a very loose version of what this proposal currently is, which isn't really fleshed out at all. So, I guess this is just a note really that if we wanted to to move B forward because of these deadlines we've got, then that's probably a, quite an urgent thing to do to make sure that we can, uh, as in the next time we have this conversation, probably should be talking about B. Um, however, obviously, if A doesn't work for any reason, for anybody, we need to go back and do that as well. So <laughs> this is potentially quite derailing in terms of timescales, but obviously we need to do it and do it right. So, um, yeah. I think we need more clarity and we need documented somewhere more precisely what use cases we're trying to cover here. I mean, A, A and B are very useful abstractions. Um, I think they could probably do with some more detail. Well, uh, I think to, to, to help that A, A is option one, B is option two and three. Uh, they don't think they've changed since the beginning of the call really. Um, it's just that I think we're, we're kind of getting into the detail of, of how that would work and making sure we have, we fully understand the, implications of them but from a technical perspective the things we've talked about today haven't i think they've, they've not changed anything uh, in terms of what what we've got so far in that proposal um apart from potentially the um the the, the things that stephen was talking about there um, well, yeah, yeah I, th I think I, th I think it would probably be good to verify that assumption um so i'm wondering if we can quickly get together use cases um relating specifically to MCR Active and Active Westminster on the ground um, as, as examples for wider specification development. And if we could get those into GitHub so that we could all take a look at them, I think that would be useful. Um, I'm just wondering how that effort gets led. Um, I think um, Alice and I can help with that. Mm -hmm. From an MCR point of view, uh, it sounds like MCR and, and well, Stephen and Alice and Anne Maria might speak anyway to clarify that. Um, and we can share those and then from an active Westminster point of view I can I can certainly clarify um, but yeah I don't think it's too much of a step away from what Nick's got in one two and three but it can definitely put some a uh, bit more detail around it if that's helpful I think I think that would be helpful yeah um, and, and it, it sounds like work that sort of needs to be done anyway so if we can just get that that work publicly viewable somewhere that would be fantastic um, you know name, namely github um, so can I leave that with uh, with the people Nish just identified? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, and I'll I'll ping people who are on the call and other invitees to this to this um, uh, to this meeting with uh, with those documents as they become available. Um, okay. Uh, we are now two minutes over. Um, were there any other issues that anybody wanted to raise? at least as maybe a note for a, for a future agenda. Yeah, Tim, we, we didn't cover the last point of the further questions, communications, which was about cancellations. And perhaps we haven't got time for that today, but uh, it just needs to be understood how right, that's okay. going to be handled. We do need to flag that up as an urgent issue. Right, okay. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. absolutely. That was, yeah. 
well I, that's probably another prerequisite to move this forward mm -hmm. if we need to take that into another call or something um yeah i think i think so um maybe nick nish and i should talk a little bit offline about whether we need to schedule another call in a possibly next week or at any rate before uh the next call um because there's a two-week lag um, and this seems fairly urgent but we can do that offline um uh, can i uh, suggest sorry it's jamie here and i joined me but uh, mm -hmm. Stephen, we've been speaking with uh, Viv around that cancellation point, and there's a legal question around um, data processor, um, and it might be worth getting her legal point of view from it. What's the qu what's the question, Jamie? Sorry, quickly, just in case we lose it in the future. Yeah. What's the what's the summary so, of it? So, if um, uh, if uh, for example, Payfinder are going to be uh, getting in touch with customers to inform them of a cancellation, then they become a data processor. Um, without that type of communication, um, we could actually be just a data controller. Um, the problem about becoming a data processor is it then puts a liability on, um, on GLL in this example, um, which uh, is best avoided if possible. So um, in this case, um, uh, it may be easier for kind of GLL to be able to um, process cancellation uh, from a legal point of view, unless we accept the fact that the, the breaker becomes a data processor. Yes, I would. I would be interested in challenging that because I think if if you're uh, if you're capturing the original detail as you as a as a broker in like MCR would be then you are the controller of that information. And if you need to pass on cancellation information, provided that you um, are not uh, given any further um, personal data by the, by the seller or by the booking system, which with the spec as it is, you wouldn't be, you should just be able to use your existing information to, to contact them regarding the cancellation. Yeah, I would agree with that as well, but it's um, something we've been discussing with uh, GLL and, uh, we're running through at the moment. Okay. That sounds that sounds like a super useful thing to, to bring into scope because if that's going to create a problem, then we've got that that might pose a, a, a fairly major challenge to the spec if if we've got our GDPR uh, stuff upside down without realizing it. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that would be great to pick up as soon as possible. Okay. I will open. I will open that as a separate. GitHub issue for the moment in order to track that. Um, and yeah, we should just keep that communication public as well. And again, fairly urgent. Uh, so um, it, J Jamie, are you saying that you've got a uh, conclusion to that or is that something you're working through and, and therefore there's a, is there like legal counsel involved in that? Uh, yeah, we're towards the end of working through it, I'd say. Okay, amazing. Yeah. It would be good to get yeah. So if 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 we're able to track that somewhere or or, or um we'll get that into that GitHub issue Tim uh, reference, then mm -hmm. um, we we can also um it helps us to additionally challenge that just in case there's uh, I'm sure they've got it all covered, but um, <laughs> I'd love to do that if if it does look like it's going sideways. Uh, I'd love to at least have an opportunity to challenge it in case uh, uh, yeah it, that that would help. <laughs> that's um that's. Uh... Um, I mean, should I try and outline the, the case and, um, and get that over to you? That would be great. Cool. And sorry, uh, yeah, if you could copy me into that, that would be great, Jamie. Yeah, no problem. Yes, yeah, so we'll, and we'll aim, if we could aim to put that on, on GitHub, which we can do through that, that process. Yeah, that's, that would be the best thing. Cool. Okay, um, plenty to think about there then. Um, hopefully we can move this forward uh, quickly. And I'll just thank you all for being on the call and I'll let you know when the notes are written up and the slides and video are available. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, thanks everybody. Cheers. Thanks, Tim.